Hello and welcome back to Rewildology, the nature podcast that explores the human side of conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. Wow, did the month of May fly by so quickly! We learned about koalas, introduced a brand new social platform specially made for the conservation community, discussed rewilding the dynamics through links reintroductions, and traveled across Tanzania. If you missed an episode and would like to hear a little snippet before diving into the full thing, listen to these highlights and then go back to the episode that piques your interest the most. Okay, here we go. First in May, we sat down with Daniel Claude, PhD, conservation biologist and author of the new book called Koala, A Natural History in an Uncertain Future. But one thing that your book taught me, and we, we can actually start to get into this right now, is there are so many misconceptions about koalas that I didn't even, I didn't even realize were misconceptions. I was just so ignorant and naive about the species just because that's just what we've always said about this is how koalas live. This is how they are. This is their behavior. This is what they do. And your book definitely showed me otherwise. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Maybe give us like the koala 101 about them, why they're unique. They even like went through their natural history and their evolution and, and all kinds of stuff. But could you just almost spew on us koalas and the, the one on, 101 on them? Yeah, well, I, I guess, um, you know, you know the, the perception that koalas are very simple and, and straightforward animals. Um, and, I mean, koalas are one of the most well-known and, and famous conservation species in the world, in actual fact. So there is a, there is a lot of politics around koalas um, and that, you know, they receive a huge amount of conservation money. Um, and, and, you know, they are iconic in, in the sense that, you know, a bit like being the poster child for conservation in some ways for, for you know, um, like a panda or, or polar bears or that, those sorts of iconic animals. So, so it is a really big issue in conservation. And, and of course, it's confusing for a lot of biologists because biologists will say, well, koalas aren't, as a species, anywhere near endangered. Uh, they, they are um, actually exceedingly common in the southern forests of Australia but they are endangered and seem to be going extinct in the east coast forest to the north, so uh, which is where people are worried about them. So there's this kind of complication around around koalas, and I guess I'm very wary of this of the, of the stories we tell about species and and well actually any stories. It's it's part of the thing I like to do with my books is to really unpack what what are the stories we tell, why do we tell those stories. And what's, what's, what's the truth, what's real, what, what, what's it got an evidence base for it. So, so I'll often want to go back to the archives and double check everything. Um, but in the case of koalas, I had to use a real wide range of scientific evidence to try and unpack them. So that's, you know, I start the book in the fossil history because I think we see koalas as this singular species, unlike anything else, uh, but it's also always useful to know what their family history is. And if we go back into the fossil record, we find there's a whole range of different species that have extinct that koalas are related to. And we get a much better sense of what kind of an animal they are right. if you look at what their close relatives are. Uh, so that so they're not as singular. I mean, they, they are still pretty singular, but they're not as isolated as we think of them. And it, And it's important to try and get away from that idea well, I mean, look at that idea about them being the last of their kind, because we, we have a tendency to blame animals for their own extinction. You know, we'll, we'll say like the panda is, is um, stupid, maladapted, has a really dumb diet and is going extinct because it can't breed properly. Um, and we have the same narrative with koalas in some ways, even though we, we can love it to death. We will still say it's it's slow, it's stupid, it has a dumb diet, it you know it eats toxic leaves, and it's doomed to extinction. So this idea of being doomed to extinction has been going on for as long as uh, Europeans and settlers have been talking about koalas. 
And I don't think that's true at all because they're actually extremely resilient animals. They have bounced back from extinction at least twice, near extinction, of course, at least twice that we know of. Uh, and once very recently with, with hunting of koalas in Australia. Uh, and pre before that, with the great megafauna extinction that wiped out a lot of the Ice Age animals. So, so koalas suffered from a huge extinction event, near extinction event then too. So, you know, they're a really, so, so they're a really resilient species. And I, and I think that was the interesting thing for me to look at is, is how that came about. And in the process of unpacking that, of course, I unpacked a whole heap of really amazing information around how koalas are so well adapted for um, the trees they live in specifically. So the co-evolution of eucalypts and koalas uh, is a really incredible story. And I think that really, really helps us to understand exactly what's going on with them, why they're difficult to breed, why they need so much space, um, all of those sorts of things. Second in May, we met Megan Crump, who is the mastermind behind Key Conservation, a new social platform designed specifically for the conservation community. So when did you realize that there was this disconnect within the conservation community? Did you have like a particular experience or how, how did, were the seeds planted that developed and grew, literally grew, into what you're doing now? Yeah, honestly, it was multiple different experiences. So I've had a lot of varied uh, jobs. So I've worked with different species and different organizations. You know, I've worked, I did a fellowship with the San Diego Zoo, was doing uh, reintroduction work for the endangered um, Stevens kangaroo rat. So I did translocations for that. I also worked with the San Diego Zoo again at the Keho uh, Bird Conservation Center, working with the like extinct in the wild Alala and working about how you know doing captive breeding and release and then like restoring the ecosystems for the release and then i did invasive plants stuff uh all over, over. you know <laughs> yeah and i you know it's so i did i was a park ranger in Ye at yellowstone i worked in bear management in yosemite so i've done a lot of different things and then i was um and then i did sea turtle research in the caribbean and so like all these experiences started feeling like there was a lot of reoccurring patterns like the same problems were coming through where there was a disconnect between the work that we were doing and the people around us who wanted to get more involved or had no idea that we were even doing some of this stuff. You know, so for example, when I was in Hawaii, um, we, we were looking, just kind of doing um, some research to see if we could find if there was like um, some, you know, all of us still in the wild. And when you're out there talking to people, what we're looking for, people were like, what's, what's that? What's an, mm. what's an alala, you know, and like they didn't even know um, that we that these species existed and that, that we were looking for them and that there's this whole program behind them. And it's like, you know, you're on an island and it's like, it's pretty small, you know, not small, but like, you know, feel like <laughs> you know a lot of what's going on and stuff. And it's like, so it, it was like, wow, people don't even know this is happening. But, uh, you know, just that kept happening all around. And there was like the sea trail project I was working on. That's really what kicked off the whole idea for key conservation. It's the story I always tell because when we were working down there, we had a, a hotline that people could call that like if they had anything that was going on, you know, Citro related that needed our assistance, they would call this this line, which is <laughs> we call the turtle phone, which is really funny. Um, and one day we got a, a call about a Citro nest that was being washed out because the development made the, the beach really short. So the, the turtle oh. nested really close to the ocean. So it was, you know, the eggs were getting exposed and getting washed out. Someone was like, you have to get down here. Like they're going to get washed away. And so we had this like uh, patrol vehicle. We, we, you know, we came out of our, our house that we were staying in and someone didn't fill up the gas tank, which, you know, who did that, you know, <laughs> but we'll never know. Uh, but there's, you know, we didn't have enough gas to get down there. So we're like, okay, we used to keep our projects fun in a jar in the house so we'd pull from it and then pay for gas and like necessities for the project. And um, we went in there and there was like coins left, you know, oh, nothing no. to like, and we're like, oh, you know, crap. And, you know, we got a, you know, biologists, we don't get paid that much. We got a stipend um, to pay for our food. You know, we got pre stay and stuff, but we had to pay for our food. So we ended up using our stipend to pay for the gas. And I was just thinking like, of course, of course, we were like, it wasn't even a second thought. You're like, we're going to do this. We're going to get down there and do all this stuff. And then, you know, we were, we called the, the manager and they're like, okay, we'll get you more project funds. But it was just like that, that constant battle of like, do we have enough? We're not sure. 
And we grabbed some t-shirts that we had that we would like, you know, sell people like to like raise money, like when we're out there. So we grabbed some of those, you know, we went down and we, on the way down there, I was just thinking like, this is just crazy to me that we're in this position when it's just so many people around the world, like love sea turtles, right? And they would just be like, oh my gosh, I would love to help you in this moment. I'll give you, you know, 10 bucks or five bucks or whatever, like just save the sea turtles, you know? And I was like, the only way we can reach out to these people right now is to make a post on like Facebook or, you know, Instagram, and then hope somebody sees it and then they can get to our, go to our website. And then, you know, there's no guarantee, you know, we just, there's this whole like difficult, like, you know, flow of getting to to support and stuff. So, but the irony was like, we went down to the beach and it's actually was on a beach that we nicknamed Millionaire's Beach because it has millionaire, like homes are just millions of dollars. And pretty much everyone that's walking that beach is like very well off, you know, and not for for very long, we were like, you know, working on getting that nest pulled out. And there's pe- a whole group of people all around us being like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, uh, how can I help? And we're showing them what, you know, what we're doing and, and you kind of educating them like why <laughs> awkwardly that this development is causing this problem. And they're just like, oh, geez, I didn't know. And, um, and so I was just like, you know, we sold some shirts that day. We're like, yay, we made our money back. We got our, <laughs> our stipend back. We can use it for food and stuff. And then we got some more to buy some gas to, for the rest of the time. And, and I just thought when it kind of hit me, I was like, all right, this is crazy. Like there's so many, I would love to tell people like, Hey, like you can get involved in like those hatchlings, you know, they're going to come, they're going to actually hatch um, in a couple of weeks and then we're going to release them. And they're like, well, can we see them? And I'm like, yeah, like just keep watching our Facebook page and we'll let you know when we're going to do it. And I was like, how cool would it be if we had a way to alert them? in real time or have a geo-based alert system where it's like, hey, are you in this area? Are you vacationing here or whatever? Come and be a part of this experience. And it's like, you know, there's so many stories where people like have these moments in nature or moments with a species where it's like it changed them, right? Like that's what makes it so special. And that's why we're all so like passionate about it. We can all agree, like we have to save it because it's important, right? So imagine all these moments that we could create if we were able to connect people um, because they didn't even know this is happening, right? So that's kind of like where wanting to kind of <clears throat> start that with key. And then also realizing that this isn't an isolated incident. There's a many organizations all over the world who are having these incredible moments that they could be sharing with people, but nobody knows they're happening. Or vice versa, like there's these like really dark, hard moments that organizations are going through and they feel like nobody knows and nobody is there, right? And so... I, I kind of wanted to create this platform to be like uh, a way for the world to like have the backs of conservationists. Like we got you, tell us what's going on. Like we can help you, you know? And cause I feel, I truly do believe that like people want to get involved. They just don't know how, like, they're just like, well, what could we do? Or like, what's going on? But we needed to make it easy for conservationists to like actually reach out as well. So <laughs> I'll stop going on and on, but that's kind of where, this whole platform started kind of emerging. Next up in May, we have a thoughtful discussion with Vedran Slijepjevic, DVM, co-founder of the Life Links Project in Croatia. So let's go back to the links, which is obviously your love and that you've had so much work in hand on. So before we dive deep, like really deep into Life Links, could you maybe take us through the history of the links in your area because you you briefly mentioned an inbreeding problem and stuff. So what has happened with the links up until now? Yeah. If we look a lot back in, in the past, then we can see that the, the links actually primarily died out in, in the Enerics at the beginning of 20th century. Uh, its extinction was primarily due, due to hunting as the people uh, looked at them as as a problem animal for game, you know, like like competition, and also uh, at the moment the the habitat was high, highly reduced as more people lived in the forest, lived from wood industry, and at the time they didn't have transportation to go to from forest home and then again. They actually had to live in the forest. As a, as people lived in the forest, they couldn't have livestock in the forest, and they were hunting animals around. And 
as they were hunting animals like roe deer, chamois, and another red deer, they actually reduced the numbers of those species, which again influenced the, the lynx. Those people also recognized the lynx as direct competition and worked directly in hunting of lynx. So in time, by the beginning of 20th century, the lynx in Dianerics died out completely. Hmm. And uh, it was like that for 70 years. And in 1973, Slovenian foresters and biologists together released uh, six lynx in Kočevski Rog area in Slovenia. And that is considered to be one of most successful reintroductions of bird carnivores anywhere. Because those six lynxes that were released, four females and two males, they were breeding and spreading rapidly throughout the dinerics because they had really great situation for them. Because in time, angulate, angulate densities improved as forest management became a lot better and also hunting management were, was working towards increasing angulate numbers. And uh, other fun fact is that roe deer, uh, which is the main prey of Eurasian lynx, was developing 70 years without a predator like lynx. <laughs> you know, they completely forgot about <laughs> lynx. So I would dare to say that almost every young lynx that left his mother found a new territory and had a lot of prey that didn't know about a predator like him. <laughs> and yeah, and, and that, that's how they spread very fast uh, already from from north of the Enerics, from Slovenia, all the way to Croatia and all down south to, to Bosnia. So they had a lot of territory, a lot of prey, and they, they really spread very fast. And it was like that for 10 or 20 years. It was fantastic. And the uh, lynx actually, as it spread very fast and the numbers were quite high, it was treated like a game animal and it was hunted. And there was, in Croatia, there, there was a quota of 10, around 10 lynxes per year. And every year this quota was filled. It was not a problem. There, there was a lot of lynx. But in time, they noticed that it was harder and harder to fill the quota. It was at the beginning of 90s. And they said something is happening with the lynx. We, we cannot shoot the 10 lynx we are planning to shoot. Something is happening. So in the 90s, the lynx became strictly protected. And they said, okay, now the numbers should be increasing. But the numbers didn't go mm. up. But they stayed somewhere around that. So they said again, what's the problem now? Since we were all aware that the, the population is, was started by only six individuals, of, so, of which some of them already were related, like mother and son, brother and sister. Inbreeding problems already started to, to, to take place. And uh, this primary expansion somehow just stopped. You know, like they, they, they were just like here. And first, my colleague Magda Sindicic from Veterinary Faculty she, she uh, worked on gathering historic samples from, like from trophies, first in uh, skulls, genetic samples to see, to, to try to study the, the genetics to see if there are any signs of inbreeding. At the beginning, from, I would say, further history, it was not such a big problem. But as the samples became fresher, the, the inbreeding became more and more apparent. Mm. And now our freshest samples are actually saying that all of our links are related like brothers and sisters. So oh, whoa. Our, That's our, not yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. We, we would even say more than that, but it, it's very, very high to, 
to understand how, how can you be more related than brother and sister, right? <laughs> right. like yourself. <laughs> yes. So we were aware of that a long time ago. And that's why we gathered together with both Slovenians and uh, Italians and, and other partners and uh, decided to, to start with this Link, Lynx project. As we actually, before even thinking about Lynx project, we were thinking about, okay, we have to bring new links. How, how can we do that? What, what, which is the, the simplest way? How, how many? You know, it's, it's really very complicated. And then we decided to go with, with the application to, to live. And the first application didn't pass. We use that as, as a good, huh, I would say a good lecture to, to work on, on our application. We optimized it really a lot. And, and at second time we passed, I would say with flying colors mm. and by the look of the project, it really was deserved. So it's currently, it's really going well. I don't know how brief the, this explanation is, but <laughs> you got from the beginning, yes. be, beginning of 20th century to now. So I, I guess it. Lastly, in May, I transformed my recent site inspection across Tanzania into a narrative and shared everything I encountered along the way, complete with multiple unexpected big cat sightings. Now that I was at Njozi camp, it was time for the real fun to begin. For the next four days, we departed camp before sunrise and didn't return until after sunset. The things I saw were straight out of a wild documentary. The following morning began a sunrise with migratory flamingos feasting on microscopic phytoplankton in Lake Ndutu. Driving further, we heard the characteristic call of an eagle owl and successfully found not one, but two owls cuddled up together in a tree. Then we were off to find the loves of my life, big cats. First, we found two big lion males of the marsh pride snoozing away in a tall bush. Following, we exited the trees and headed out onto the vast plains in search of cheetahs. During our wanderings, we came across a coalition of five young males with manes barely large enough to call them adults. The plains are a no man's land, an area for these males to grow, gain strength, and in time, challenge the established males with prime habitat tucked within the trees. One can only watch sleeping cats for so long, so we ventured off again in search of cheetahs. Success. Tucked behind a tall bush lay a beautiful female cheetah. Yusuf, one of the wild sources resident biologists at Njozi camp who studies Serengeti big cats, decided to name the female after me. Little did he know that the landscape in which we found her was the meaning of my name. A brook flowing through a flowering meadow. Tears filled my eyes. I am not an emotional person, but I was so moved by the moment that I could barely contain myself from losing it. With the number of hardships that have befallen me in the past year, in that moment I knew I was right where I needed to be. Sitting in a land cruiser with two phenomenal humans watching a gorgeous cheetah named Brooke. I knew the trip was only going to go up from here. And holy crap, did it go up! The following morning, we left camp the same as the previous day, before sunrise, to see what wildlife was out and about. Not too long into our drive, we found two males and two females from the backyard pride out on morning patrol. Yusuf informed me that there were three additional males in this pride that must be out doing patrols in other parts of their territory. If only all five males were together because the series of events that happened next were straight out of a BBC film. As we were following the pride partaking in their morning ritual, we looked into the distance and spotted a massive male hippo that hadn't yet made his way to the lake. A dangerous decision. We weren't the only creatures in the bush that spotted the hippo. The two lion males did as well. The behavior of the pride flipped on a dime and they switched from casually meandering along the lake shoreline to hunting mode. I hope one day scientists will understand nonverbal communication because the males were clearly communicating to the females who were a quarter of a mile away, asking them to join the hunt. Sosi and Yusuf inferred that the lead female was pregnant and the hunt was too risky for the future of the pride. 
So she and her daughter kept their distance and watched. At this point, the hippo had spotted the lions and knew he was in imminent danger. The two males began to stalk and slowly approach. Male lions have the rather undeserved reputation of being lazy and relying solely on the females for their meals. As I witnessed time and time again, this just isn't true. The males are vital for taking down prey of this size and protecting their pride from other males. It was a standoff. The hippo carefully emerged from the tall grass and stared at the lions only a few feet away. In what seemed like a moment of courage and determination, the hippo bolted with both male lions springing after it. Fortunately for the hippo, only two of the five males were present, and he dragged both full-grown lions all the way to the water's edge, a distance of at least 300 meters. The hippo crashed into the water, looked at the lions, and started spraying his poop in a territorial display. After the lions accepted defeat, they went off in an apparently great mood, giving each other headbutts, splashing through water, and licking each other's manes. After this rather impressive show of strength and dedication, Sosi and Yusuf officially named the coalition of males Wakazi, which means residents in Swahili. They made it obvious to us, and I'm sure all other lions in Ndutu, that they were here to stay. We also decided it was time to move on and see what else the bush had to offer this morning. And that is it, a snapshot of May's wide-ranging episodes. If you have a question about any of these episodes, please submit your question in the Free Wildologist Facebook group. Next month, we are releasing Rewildology's Wildest Hits, Volumes 1 through 5, as determined by number of downloads, engaged listeners, and comments received. Stay tuned to hear which episodes made the top five list. They may surprise you. As always, I want to thank you for being a part of the Rewildology community. If you'd like to support the show, some zero-cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter at Rewildology.com, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at Rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to thank Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focusrite gear I use to record the show, head on over to rewildaudio.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet. <laughs>